I know many of you are already eating, but why don't we just start with a word of thanks, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this food, this drink, and this fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for the ability to come together in person and be able to share what it means to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to be on this journey together, this sometimes winding and rocky road. We thank you, Lord, for this event. We thank you for the seminary and the Mokla Center. And we thank you for the Institute and for our speakers. We pray that their experience and that their wisdom would speak to us anew. But most of all, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, into this place at this time and into our hearts. Open those hearts. Open our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody. And, uh, you know, post-COVID, you never know how many people to expect. It's lovely to see the tables filling up. And uh, there's plenty of pizza, so please feel free at any time to go back for more and salad as well. So, Let Love Speak is our title. And... Some of you may have read an article that was widely circulated from the New York Times recently, written by a public intellectual who happens to be a Christian by the name of David Brooks. And this is what he wrote. Think of your 12 closest friends. These are the people you vacation with, talk about your problems with, do life with in the most intimate and meaningful ways. Now, imagine if six of those people suddenly took a political or public position you found utterly vile. Now, imagine learning that those six people think that your position is utterly vile. You would suddenly realize that the people you thought you knew best and cared about most had actually been total strangers to you all along. You would feel disoriented, disturbed, unmoored. Your life would change. This is what has happened over the past six years to millions of American Christians, especially evangelicals. When the Mockler Center made the pivot from being the Mockler Center for faith and ethics in the workplace to the Mockler Center for Faith and Ethics in the Public Square, we knew that we would start addressing issues that we hadn't traditionally addressed. And with the addition of our new fellows, and hopefully you've all gotten a copy electronically of our newsletter, some of our fellows are here today, uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Nat Gant from uh, Harvard Law School, uh, Dr. Sarah Menard, who's the associate director of the center, et cetera. Uh, when we got together and we started talking about what is really becoming the most important issue in churches and communities today in this intersection of faith and the public square, this topic came out on top. What are we going to do about this creeping incivility in the church? Any of you are on social media, you know that people exchange ideas with each other in ways that would never normally be exchanged in polite company. People somehow feel emboldened and empowered to put everything in capital letters and resort to ad hominem attacks as the norm. Unfortunately, that incivility has found its way into the church. And in many ways, Christians have fed that incivility. So we have invited two experts, one who is a lifelong pastor and who is uh, an alumna of Gordon Conwell uh, Theological Seminary, and another, Bob Staines, who is a consultant to churches in this very area. So let me introduce to you the Reverend Joyce Sherahook. She is the rector of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Air Mass. She has a Master of Divinity from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary 
and has been an Episcopal priest for 34 years. So she has navigated some of the most controversial issues that the church has seen in decades. She believes it is key to a healthy, growing congregation for formation to be developed for people of all ages. She and her husband, Robert, who is also a graduate of Gordon-Conwell, have two grown daughters, a Shetland sheepdog, and a miniature horse. They live in Topsfield, and I look forward to bringing my grandson to meet that miniature horse. But thank you for being here, Reverend Hook. Also with us is Bob Staines. Bob is a seasoned facilitator of challenging conversations about identity, religion, and values. He has trained over 30,000 professionals in communication and dialogue facilitation. He has worked with Boston University. He has worked with Harvard University, Harvard Divinity. Uh, his, his resume is too long to uh, list here, but I got to know Bob because he is actually consulting our church right here in Gloucester, which suffered a split recently, and we are right in the middle of this dilemma. As part of that, we called an interim pastor, who also happens to be a senior fellow of the Mockler Center, and that is uh, Dr. Jim Longhurst. Jim is going to be the moderator today. Jim has been a pastor for over 40 years. He, too, is a graduate of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. You see a pattern here? Uh, he, he has been a pastor in Geneva, Switzerland, one of the most diverse and complex places anyone could conceivably be a pastor. But he's also been a pastor of a New England congregation, very similar to the kinds of congregations many of you will serve. So we will have each of our presenters give a presentation Jim will have a follow-up question for each of them. Then it's coming to you. We will pass around the mics. Please, as people are speaking, take notes. You have these little, uh, little uh, books in front of you. Please take one, uh, make notes, be prepared to ask questions. This is a safe space. No question is out of bounds. So without further ado, uh, Jim, I will turn it over to you. <clears throat> okay. Joyce, we want to start with you. And uh, if you would, share us, with us your experiences of shepherding the people that you serve, you've served as, as a priest. And particularly, how have you been able to resist destructive conflict and divisiveness and in turn build healing and restoration in ways that lets love speak? So to be sure that I'm organized and didn't wander, I did a few PowerPoint slides for this. Um, and Bob asked me, and I don't consider myself an expert, so, but it was really a privilege to be asked this question because it made me really think hard about the things that I had done more intuitively and had more discovered along the way. So this is gonna look more organized than it was as it happened. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, so, um, let love speak. So just to say, it's obvious, but types of potential conflict that we all have and that are part of our churches, interpersonal, theological, cultural, and political. Keeping those in mind, because you get divisiveness out of all of them. And one thing I want to say is that church divisiveness is not new. And this is a marker in Danvers, Massachusetts, outside of the church where the witch hysteria started, local history, um, the church had, it's fascinating from a church dynamics point of view, the church called Samuel Parris, who had not been able to complete Harvard Divinity School because of family and money conflicts. They got him cheap. They argued with him a lot. Um, they cut his salary because he didn't have his uh, divinity credential. All sorts of stuff went on there that was conflictual. Um, the pastor before him had left and gone to Maine because of some of the way that the 
the d dynamic in the church. Um, it was in his household that the slave Tichaba began to make accusations and his niece. Um, and what did he do? He got up and preached very fiery, very angry sermons in response. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. So um, it's not new and how the clergy respond is important. Um, and just to say this, this is, we all know this, our current context is difficult. Um, it's existed in the past, it existed in the New Testament, divisiveness, but we have individualism, the speed of cultural change, the suspicion of institutions, skepticism toward authority figures, electronic communication and social media, and social norms increasingly flouted by very high profile people. So it's, it's kind of a mess, right? Um, when I started, a lot of denominational workshops on conflict in your church, just in terms of interpersonal conflict. Um, but it's, it's widened. So the question, how do we foster a positive congregational culture? And this is sort of my overview of it. I think be vision focused. Research has shown, if you look into it, that churches that have a vision that is articulated clearly are less subject to conflict. And it's, it's having a goal. It's having a goal that you can call people to, uh, to all together into, move toward. Um, the other one that was mentioned, adult, offer adult formation that explores issues objectively and theologically. There's more to be said about adult formation in general, but I've found, and particularly in my denomination, in a mainline denomination where confirmation at teenage was prevalent, adults have had no formation. If they grew up in the church, and if they're coming from another church or from nothing, they have nothing, um, because there's such a low cultural uh, reservoir in the faith. Um, have leadership that models listening and inclusion. You need to surround yourself with people who can do that and build structure and guardrails into your system. And that's gonna be something on, my, on the table that we can look at later. So what I stumbled on really was using as my vision focus the baptismal covenant from the Book of Common Prayer. Um, you may have something like that in your denomination. I don't know what yours is, but as I began, I was preparing people who had children to be baptized, and I was looking for a way to call them to faith when they might be, have done, be doing that as sort of a ritual thing. And I started to really, I developed a, a class, a three session class um, that uses the uh, Book of Common Prayer and the vows around the ba baptism that you take. And I'm gonna just sort of skip through this bit of it a little bit and get to the, um, the, the final piece of what it offers. It offers a conversion of heart and life, turning from evil and turning to Christ. So one of the first things we do in that is we renounce evil in three forms, and then you turn and you affirm Christ in three forms. And they roughly correspond to renouncing metaphysical evil, uh, renouncing social um, and corporate evil, and renouncing personal sinful desires that draw me from the love of God. And then you, you uh, affirm Christ um, as your savior. Um, you affirm Christ, you put your whole trust in him, not in systems um, of the world, and then um, you make him Lord. Um, that conversion, I think, is key. Um, and then with that baptismal covenant, we, we have the creed. Um, so you can do a little teaching about not a lot in three sessions. Um, and then there are five questions in that covenant, which are core Christian life practices. Um, I call them the five W's, nobody else does. Um, but the last two are about seeking and serving Christ in all persons and loving your neighbor as yourself, and also working for justice and peace. And I think those are really, really key, and I'll come back to them again um, as we talk. So I, that, that structure um, has, I, when I came to my current church, I, I decided that what I was gonna do was find a way for every person in my church to get that three-session cl uh, class 
where they concentrated on the baptismal covenant. So not just people who were bringing babies to baptize or adults who were coming for adult baptism, but I, my first Lenten class, was I invited the whole parish to come. Um, I use it for adults and new members, and I just try to have pounded it into my congregation um, because I think it's so essential. Um, so, um, so that said, that baptismal covenant, um, along with that, I haven't talked too much about also, finding a way to offer in a format that people can do, and for me it's Sunday morning, um, some sort of adult formation courses. And as part of those adult formations, and this is what we did a lot when I was at Trinity Topsfield, not just children's classes that happen you know, to keep them out of church so that they don't bug their parents, but a mutual time where everybody of all ages is in, in some sort of class, and then there's things for the adults. Maybe one of them is an ongoing Bible study. Maybe the other class, though, can pick up current topics. Um, and really examining those topics biblically and theologically, maybe reading a book together, whatever. So I'm gonna give you my example of what happened in two churches, and I have been intimately connected with both of those churches. One of them was Trinity Topsfield, and the other one is the church where I am now, uh, where a friend of mine was the rector. So we, at Trinity Topsfield, we offer discussions on homosexuality um, in the 90s knowing that it was, it was coming up for votes in our diocese, it was gonna be, it was a national conversation coming up in our general convention, ordination of homosexuals, very hot topic, as hot as women's ordination was when I was here. <laughs> um, and so over the course of a couple of years, we offered two adult forums on that. Um, one of them was Peter Gomes's book um, on the Bible. Another one, we had panels where we had, um, people who were gay come in and people, it, we just had a lot of conversation. It was really um, both class, but we did that. Um, and then um, the senior pastor, the rector had gone on to another congregation and I was there, we didn't have an interim yet. And Jean Robinson of New Hampshire was elected the first married gay bishop in the Episcopal church. And that fell on me in the summer to pastor uh, in the absence of my uh, other clergy person. I had learned a process called sacred listening. Um, and so what I did was I called the people into the library after the service and I said, between services, if you wanna come and talk about this issue, I had a structure for that. Bob knows all about those kind of structures where there's listening and there's not crosstalk. Wrote some questions up. Uh, not one single person, even the people who were angry about that issue and disagreed, left that church while I was there. I, it was amazing. The church that I serve now essentially split, split over it. They were in a clergy transition. Their predecessor would not talk about the issue. It was radioactive for her for whatever reason. Um, and then when it happened, nothing happened. Um, and I inherited a congregation, and then it was followed with a pastoral transition, didn't work. So I inherited a congregation that was 50% of what it had been before when I finally went there. So anyway, I think that it makes a difference to have those conversations. Even if people don't come out of them agreeing, they've had some experience talking about it. Um, another church that I served, my example, uh, closer to hand, the previous, uh, pastor, the rector, had been, somebody in the parish had threatened to sue her um, when she had discovered some financial improprieties in how their preschool was run uh, by, by the person who threatened to sue her. Um, and she left really fast. Uh, I was offered by the diocese as a priest in charge. I had a vestry that uh, talked over each other and yelled at each other, my, my governing board. Um, my exposure to Montessori, <laughs> A children's education program, I had learned um, how to make silence with a group of people, with preschoolers. Um, and it's a dynamic technique that everybody should know. And I brought my little crystal bell that I bought for 10 cents at the thrift store um, to meeting, put it on the table in front of me, and I said, when we're discussing something, we'll listen to each other so that we can hear. But if people cross talk over each other, 
I will ring this bell and there will be 30 seconds of silence. And we practiced it. What's it like to have 30 seconds of silence? How do you breathe into it? Um, I, did, I maybe did it four times before they, it broke their habit. Um, so that's what I mean by building some structure in. Um, on your table, and you can look at it later, is the vestry covenant from St. Andrews, from the church that I'm at now. And I have no credit, I can take no credit for this. Um, they developed this with somebody. Um, it's the, on one of the sheets. Every vestry person every year signs this behavioral covenant um, about how we behave in our meetings. It's got some email things on there too because they had some problems with that. And everybody signs it again, not just the new people. We're reminded of it and we can go back to people when we have some issues um, about that. I think that's really important. Um, and then finally, um, another example that Jim and I talked about. Um, I, I think we all have to think of it a lot. Most of you in this room are younger than I am. Um, very careful thought about how we use our electronic communication. And I could, I mean, that's a whole seminar in itself. But one of the things that I've just become so aware of is it's easy for me to sit and email people and to respond by email. But first of all, I do no pastoral counseling by email. Anything that's intimate enough that it could be forwarded, I never do it. I take it right off. I call people up. I talk to them. Um, and any issue that becomes hot at all, um, I just had one that was really stupid. It was about scheduling of people to read and participate on Sunday morning. And somebody had gotten an email and they responded, if you're going to do it this way, I quit. And my response was, our intention was to do this, but hey, you know what? Let's talk about this face to face. And there was a whole layer of misunderstanding in what had happened. I settled that with that person in, you know, like 30 seconds be between coffee hour and church, um, where I could have spent an hour emailing her back and forth, and who knows where it would have gone. So, no one to take the conversation to face to face is really important. Um, and then I'm just going to say a few words, I'm almost done, about you, the clergy leader. And um, th I, this was attributed to a social worker, and Mr. Rogers is supposed to have carried this quote. I don't know if that's really true, but I love the quote. There is no one you can't learn to love once you've heard their story. I carried that myself in my calendar so that I would look at it. Look at your parishioners in terms of their story. Whatever their hostile attitude is or their opinion that you don't like, there's a story behind it. And you need to hear their story um, so that you can love them in Christ's name. Um, when you preach on hot button topics, ask questions rather than making pronouncements. Um, I've found that you can raise a lot of things you want to raise, but it's really different to say, this is, da, 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 and, ver and, and say, I wonder what Jesus would think if, <laughs> you know? It's really a different way, and you're inviting people, you're inviting people to discover it from themselves. Another thing from my Montessori program, you want to discover it for yourself. Um, and when you meet that person who's so angry, ask them why. I, can you tell me the story behind why you're not Da, 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 da. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure that will, you'll hear more of that. Um, learn to listen and then ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are your friend. Um, that's a little more of the same. And then I would say, pastor out of Jesus' teaching on non-retaliation. Um, I think I learned, the thing I learned from that very difficult and very hostile church was that if I cranked up the hostility, I would get more hostility. But what I needed to do, and sometimes it was just stepping back and letting people <laughs> do themselves in, to hang themselves with their own rope in terms of how they behaved, um, but not to up the ante. Um, so really thinking about nonviolence. Um, and then I'm just going to say this because this is my opinion. In order to grapple with the controversial issues of our day, Theologically and biblically, Christians need to be grounded in the prophetic message of the Old Testament, 
we really need to value that. And the central teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know what your denomination is, but I think as churches can lift those two essential pieces up, they're better able to address the issues of our day. Um, there's a lot probably more to say there. Um, so in order to deal with the divisiveness of our culture and develop interpersonal skills and, cre uh, and create structure, talk about the challenges of conflict and division in the culture in your preaching. Make it part of when Paul gives those injunctions, you know, get in there. Um, set explicit standards for the use of email, social media by your leadership. Um, think through your own use of these pastorally. Um, I'm often a, a little appalled when I look at my colleagues' use of Facebook about how much they share with people. I actually don't friend my parishioners on Facebook out of my personal Facebook account. I think you really want to be careful, especially with your family. Um, offer instructions in sacred listening and caring conversations. Bob will cover, cover that. Offer those in your congregation. Some of my most popular adult forums uh, since 2016 were about how do we talk about controversial issues over the Thanksgiving table. And we have a mediator in our congregation who came in and talked about how the precepts of mediation uh, could be applied to your family table. Um, and so then just offer those, exp um, mm -hmm. those kind of issues. And I'm gonna end with 2 Corinthians, which you could read, so thank you. Thank you, Joyce. We're going to turn to you now, Bob, and it's a real pleasure to have you as well here with us. And uh, <clears throat> so you came to us at Union when we were in the midst of chaotic communication confusion, all tied up in knots. And then you did your stuff, and you worked with us over the last five months. And we've found our way. We're finding our way as a result of your tutelage and your guidance and the structures that you've put in place. But this is the territory that you've been working in over these many years in these polarized contexts. So <clears throat> what do you do and how do you do it? And uh, how do you move people towards healing? All right. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me here. Uh, and also for the opportunity to work with your amazing church. Um, now, I need to switch presentations here. Uh, I might need some help. Oh, no, wait a minute, there it is. Let's see if I can do it all by myself. I have a grandson. Um, my grandson's name is Emerson. Actually, I'm gonna now defer to you. Um, and if I was really gonna be, we gotta talk here. Yeah. So if I was really going to be like, uh, like Emerson, uh, his favorite phrase is, I do it! I do it! But I didn't do it, so what are you going to do? Uh, well, it's great to be with you here. I'm going to talk with you uh, about uh, what I do, um, why it's necessary, why it's needed, and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the results that happen when people engage in the model of dialogue that I use, which is called Reflective Structured Dialogue, which was basically created out of family therapy ideas. I was a family therapist for 18 years before I did this work. Uh, and um, so let's launch in. So there are a lot of challenges in our world today and in our churches. So here are a few of them. Um, relationships in, in families, both the nuclear family and the church family, involving politics and religion and doctrine and all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to go through this whole list because we all know it very well. And all of them come up in the life of congregations and in the life of families. Many of the disputes that I see start here. You have people looking at the same reality, but they're looking at it from different directions, right? Uh, that thing on the floor there is either a six or a nine, depending on where you're standing and what your perspective is, what your viewing point is. And if people don't have the chance to ask each other where they're standing, and to understand what that viewpoint means to that person. They're going to get in trouble. And they're going to start arguing over what's real, what's the nature of reality of the particular thing that they're involved in. And often this is the pattern that results. Somebody says something that triggers another person. They go into the state of vigilance where they're looking for signs of danger. 
and they attack or defend against that person. And that person gets triggered, vigilance, attack and defend. Just saw it recently in a Board of Elders meeting. Contemporary music in church, two people on both sides, attack and defend, separate into parties, talk in the parking lot, pretty soon you've got a whole church divided. This is where it starts, often. And when it's destructive, it becomes like a fire that burns everybody. And it's uh, painful, and it's difficult, and as a result, congregations, and not just congregations, all the organizations that I work with, often go here. Everything freezes over. People don't talk about stuff. I worked with a church recently that had seven years after combining that they didn't talk about the disposition of property because it was too hard. They were too afraid of the fire that might result. But of course, it's still there under the surface, right? It's still there, um, ready to affect all the dynamics. Well, I love Martin Buber in addition to a lot of other people. Uh, I think Buber has some great ideas and some insights about dialogue. And one of the things that he said that I think is really important is all real living is meeting. And I take that as a core concept for the work that I do. So I want to create spaces where people can really meet each other in uh, an important and a deep way. We know from research that conversations matter, not facts, in terms of helping people shift from a relationship that is I, it, I see you as it, as a caricature, as a stereotype, to I, thou, I see you as a full human being. So not any kind of conversation is going to create the kind of meeting that Buber was talking about. I happen to be involved in a, a conversation of dialogue that I think works really well and has proven itself over the last 30 years. Uh, and this particular kind of conversation is an exchange that's guided by structure, like Joyce was talking about, and agreements, again, covenants, that enable people to feel safe enough to speak and listen. No one can guarantee anybody's full safety, but people need to feel safe enough to open up enough to hear what the other person has to say and to speak and uh, to speak, to be understood rather than convert, to listen to understand rather than win, to develop real curiosity about the other person, about those stories that Joyce was talking about. Um, Central Partners, an, institute, an organization that I'm affiliated with, has a, fr a phrase, behind every belief is a person, behind every person is a story. And by helping people understand and learn one another's stories, it breeds understanding and compassion uh, and shifts in conversation. So that is what we call reflective structured dialogue. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the structured conversations for shared purposes shaped or reflection and guided by um, commitments. In the Christian world, in the church world, here are some of the issues that I've dealt with uh, personally in working with congregations um, where dialogue has helped heal fractured congregations and relationships uh, and rifts where people have left. And you can see uh, these are all feel very familiar to you. If, as, as my friend uh, Dave Joseph, the late Dave Joseph, sadly used to say, uh, this stuff is only good if you're dealing with human beings. Um, all these things come up in uh, our work together uh, in community. So the question about what I do. Um, I think showing up, it's like what Joyce was saying about being a pastor, showing up in my role as a human being is really important. Um, and I collaborate with people, I companion people along the way, as Jim was saying, I work with a group of people along the way uh, to them creating their own process. I help explore what that old conversation is that's gotten a group in trouble uh, and help them prepare for a voyage into something new. I try to model the kind of engagement that I hope people will have with each other as I'm working with uh, planners and as I'm working with a congregation. Uh, and then I provide a, a structure for conversation and some teaching about dialogue to the groups that I'm working with, um, specifically with regard to creating agreements or covenants together, uh, the use of structured responses to questions and, um, and answers, and the importance of mutual inquiry. And along the way, what I hope to do is build individual congregations' capacity to do their own work, to plan, to facilitate, to carry the work forward. Uh, and in the process, I also facilitate these conversations and um, 
prepare others. Some congregations want to have a dialogue ministry team where they have actual people that then carry the work on over years. Um, one of the sort of testimonials that I have on my website is somebody that I worked with, a church that I worked with in 2007. Their dialogue ministry team is still operating, uh, still helping with controversies in their church. I'm very happy to do that. Well, why is this needed? I gave you the image of fire and ice, and Jim talked about chaos and confusion and fear. Um, these are the things that often come up when these difficult issues take root in our congregations. And we're humans, so when we perceive threat, whether it's threat to our identity, our way of being, our deepest held beliefs, we have characteristic responses just because of who we are. That attack and defense cycle that I mentioned, the developing of tunnel vision, of only being able to see sort of one aspect of the person that we're dealing with, which is usually the, the thing that we don't like. Um, creating simple stories about people instead of the complex stories of their lives and engaging them as if they were the only truth. And then patterns that get embedded in conversation, in congregations that recur are very difficult to break unless you have a, an approach like this. Rick Hansen, the author of uh, Hardwiring Happiness, which is a book about uh, research on interpersonal neurobiology, talks about the brain being Velcro for the bad and Teflon for the good. We tend to seek and hold on to that which is potential danger to us and it's harder to seek and hold on to what we see as good in the other person and group when we're in the middle of controversy. I see a lot of emphasis on rightness over relationship. My, my wife is a marriage and family therapist, um, mostly marriage counseling these days, 40 odd years in private practice, and she often talks about working with couples where she has to tell one person, you have to decide whether you're more interested in being right are more interested in being in relationship. And I think it's true in group life as well. Um, the emphasis on rightness, I'm right and you're wrong, and uh, defining myself in terms of what I'm against has gotten uh, congregations in trouble for a long time. And uh, it's that demonization of difference that's talked about in the title. So how does this process work? Reflective structured dialogue. Let's say a little bit about that. Some of the premises at least this is stuff that I've developed over my years of doing this work, 27 years now and doing dialogue work. Most people really do want to be known. When there's an invitation for them to tell their story, they're ready to tell it. If it means that they're going to be known, not as a stereotype. Because most people don't want to be reduced to a stereotype. Most people resist being worked on. That is, if they're invited to a conversation and there's some subtle message that they're going to be tr somebody's going to try to convert them or educate them in some way, they're out of there. Um, and then people are surprised by genuine curiosity when it's expressed particularly by an opponent. What doesn't work well is that education kind of conversion that I was talking about before, uh, confrontation and shaming, um, and, uh, and then just g cutting things off. Sometimes we have to do that when things get destructive, but very, very rarely. Um, but these are the things that don't work well. Uh, when I've seen groups, churches, convene people for difficult conversations, and they don't do the work of preparation and planning, this is the kind of thing that often comes up and derails things. So it's important to pay attention to that preparation and planning because every communication arrangement invites some things and discourages others, basic sort of communication theory. So when I'm working with a group, I'll often first ask them what's gone on before that they want to prevent from happening again, and what do they want to promote instead? And what conversational structures can we create that will prevent the one and promote the other. And from reflective structured dialogue, we have some tips. Create a lower threat context through ground rules, through structure, et cetera, through preparation. Prevent those old patterns and stories from coming up. Promote more complex stories being available to people so that they know all the nuance of why somebody has come to think the way that they think or believe the way they believe. And then recover unstoried experience. So people carry a lot that they don't tell, that they don't speak about. Um, had the chance to work with Joyce's congregation a couple years ago on some not dialogue stuff, but other stuff. And in the process, people started talking about their life stories and learning that there were some people that had been there for 20 years that didn't know things about the other person. So it was pretty cool. Uh, how am I doing on time? A couple minutes, OK. Uh, so some of the components of the container, uh, uh, for this kind of work, um, 
I've already mentioned collaborative recreated agreements, I'll say that again, but the structured responses and exchanges, to put out opening questions to people and have people respond with time limits and pauses and just listening and no crosstalk are really key and the chance to ask each other questions. Uh, there's a lot of handouts, by the way, on the table out there. Uh, all of them have stuff in there that will be useful to you in your ministry today. Uh, and I'm going to just skip this because I want to spend a, a moment just talking about what happens. And you'll have access to these PowerPoints too, by the way. After a dialogue project is finished or in the midst, these are the things that start to happen um, among the people that have participated. People get curious about one another. Instead of having the certainty, I know who you are, I can just you know, predict you, one, two, three, all of a sudden people get curious. They want to know more once they start hearing part of the story. And the result of that is people come away with more complex stories about one another. It becomes impossible to just see each other as uh, stereotypes and caricatures. They deepen their understanding of one another uh, and understanding why people have come to what they've come to. And in the process of hearing the stories, they develop a resonance, a heart connection with people that may be very different from them, but they can relate to their experience in some way. And that breeds compassion that people maybe didn't have before because they were so walled off. I often use the metaphor from Ezekiel, I will take from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I see that's what's happening in the dialogue process. Um, and that, of course, then tends to lead to repaired relationships and the ability to manifest the skills that they've used in dialogue, of artful inquiry, of listening to understand, et cetera. Um, when there is a decision that has to be made, the example I gave you earlier about disposition of property, the logjam can be broken. It took two years of work um, for this congregation, but they did break the logjam. They were able to have the conversations, and now they're in the process of developing uh, one of the properties that they were able to, um, to let go of. And lastly, I see shifts in the communication culture of the entire church. Once people have gone through this process, it starts to permeate out into other aspects of the church, into governance, into how uh, meetings of vestries and boards of elders are conducted, uh, et cetera, and the communication culture of the church starts to change. So I'll wrap it up there. Uh, and uh, as I say, this will be available to you through email. Q and A. Jim is going to take the privilege of the chair and each ask each of them one question. But please start thinking about the questions you want to ask. Yes, uh, you uh, following uh, Joyce. How do you sustain differentiation? What's the self care that's involved in that so you don't get flooded with all the issues in a way that loses your objectivity and your engagement? That to really enables you to maintain a sense of leadership in the midst of that. What kind of self-care sustains your differentiation? Um, I think colleague groups. It's really important to be in a colleague group um, and to find perhaps somebody who's pastored more experienced than you. Um, that's one thing. Um, and having friendships outside of your church, um, not making, having your whole social life within your congregation. I think that's probably enough. Um, knowing when to call in people like Bob. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And uh, to you, Bob. And uh, so since we've had it, this really rare privilege for me to be able to have five or so months with you, <clears throat> how has this work affected your life with God? Uh, really deeply, when I... Um, Early on in my career of doing dialogue work, I had been away from the faith for 16 years. And I was uh, doing the beginnings of a project, one of the first projects in the Episcopal Church of conversations about homosexuality. It was in the late 90s, and it was a secret conversation among two national leaders uh, on both sides of this issue. We were meeting in the basement of Trinity Church on a summer day, and it was a very, very difficult conversation where these two men told their stories they're deeply personal stories of death and loss and how they led them to opposite perspectives on this issue. I'm going to get choked up talking about this. At the end of that, one man turned to the other and said, 
I hate how you think. But I love you. My boss, Laura Chasen, the founder of Public Conversations Project, and I walked out of that room that day and turned to each other and said, we've just experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. We felt it in that room, and it started to open the door to my return to practicing uh, as a Christian and to deeper belief. And since that time, I have the intense and amazing privilege of seeing people become more permeable to the Holy Spirit as a result of this work because they're more permeable to each other. And that strengthens my faith uh, and reminds me that the Holy Spirit is around us and in us at all times, um, inviting us to connect. And, uh, and that just, you know, keeps me going. The first, first question over here, Professor Nett. Thank you both for your insightful comments. Um, I definitely uh, am resonating with the notion of, of relationship and rightness and how to marry those two. And, but I can't help but think, and we've, we talked about this as a team um, about six weeks ago, Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. And I'd, I'd like for you two to talk about that, how, and I know there's a kind of implicit behind this, what is, what is truth, and, and, but if you do, particularly as an evangelical Christian, if you're engaging in these difficult conversations and you believe that you are coming from a position of, of truth, how does, that, how does that affect really all that you've said? If it's, if it's more than just dialogue, but you're trying to, to come at it, not, not just about conversion, I understand that, you know, that point earlier, but you're, you're again trying to speak the truth in love and not just be canceled in the relationship. I thought he was asking you. <laughs> I think that's an overused verse in, or in evangelical gr groups, I, I would say, just FYI. Um, speaking the truth in love. Uh, when it comes to using that in terms of controversial issues, so women's ordination, women's role, uh, homosexuality, transgender people, I guess my response would be um, controversial things are controversial because they're controversial. Um, and to, to claim the truth is not to be open to dialogue in those situations. Uh, uh, two things, one is uh, just to say the church has changed its mind on a lot of things when it's thought it had the truth. Um, and uh, so I think that, that um, I, I always keep that in mind. Uh, I think of slavery as one uh, example of that, and there are many. Um, but I want to tell you a story. Uh, several years ago, Dorsey McConnell was an Episcopal priest who became the Episcopal Bishop of Pittsburgh. Dorsey was an evangelical, charismatic Christian who became the Bishop of the Diocese, which was the beginning of the fracture of the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion over homosexuality. It was a destroyed and devastated diocese. Um, and people were very, very deeply wounded. When Dorsey took over, he had a decision to make over whether he was going to bless same-sex unions. He called us in to create a dialogue process for the whole diocese, to hear what the mind of Christ was as spoken through the people of the body of Christ, to be factored into his decision-making. And I saw that as a way to uh, engage truth in uh, differently from just pronouncing truth. I'm not saying there's not, not a place for that, but Dorsey opened the possibility of hearing truth from a collective body of Christ that then factored into his decision to move forward in a way that did not split further the diocese. Um, so I don't know, I hope that's an answer to your question. More questions? I'll take a crack at that too, if I may. There's an old expression in the church, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. And one of the reasons we get into trouble is people confuse what is an essential and what isn't an essential. 
but we can't confuse all things. And this, I think, is our greater problem. We forget that even if we are disagreeing on something we believe to be an essential, that we hold to be true, it's still an all thing. And we've got to treat the other person with charity, with love. And I think that's the one we fall over the most, in my humble opinion. Yeah, uh, John Calvin and uh, Nate on um, his uh, parable of the wheat and the tares. He talks about discipling the tares and not just pulling them up. If there's no love, then there's not going to be the opportunity of being able to see potential growth of discipleship. So the relationship opens the door for that to continue to happen and what God would work in moving a tare and a wheat and helping God's growth of discipleship to happen. Questions? I think there have been some moments of real sincere dialogue, uh, early ecumenism, the whole conversation with Catholic and Protestant, and the place where they found agreement was kind of the lowest common denominator. So at the end of the conversation, you're not dealing with deep, deep convictions. You're dealing with kind of a lukewarm agreement that doesn't seem to satisfy very well. So how do you keep conversation, um, the, the end of conversation, deeply entrenched with deep conviction that you're not giving anything up? Uh, you know, the convicted civility, I think, is the word that you'd use. But again, it, you know, if I draw back far enough, I could probably agree with anybody, what have I given up in the midst of that conversation? Uh, could, could I just ask for a restatement of that? I'm not quite sure I'm understanding what the question is. If there is a question. Yeah, I don't know if there is a question, but I'm just, it's certainly an observation that there are times when uh, you, the, the place of, of, of agreement everyone has given up so much on either side that I just don't know what, what the agreement is. And you know, again, uh, there have been moments of Catholic Protestant dialogue that have occurred and it's been very, very good, but how constructive is it when, it's, when you've given up so much? I'll take that. And it's gonna come at it totally different. Um, I hear what you're saying about ecumenical dialogue, but I belong to a group of people, largely women, that practice a Christian monastery educational method called Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We're largely Episcopalian and Roman Catholic. Um, and we have substantial differences politically um, around, say, the ordination of women and other things, um, and other differences in terms of what we're allowed in terms of our judicatories and things. But we have very deep fellowship and a love because we're pulled by our work together, introducing children to fall in love with Jesus um, and the scripture that we hold together. And so the relationship that we have built around our shared scriptural and liturgical practices and our shared love for children uh, doesn't mean there's any, our dialogue is very productive and there's no lower common denominator to it. So I, that, that's an answer. Yeah, I'll, I, I don't know if this is going to be a, a, a direct answer or not, but, um, but I want to tell this story, so I'll use this as an occasion to tell the story. Um, I was very privileged to work with a church in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Northminster Baptist Church, which is an intentionally integrated church set up in the midst of the civil rights struggle in the 60s. And I was teaching there, and at the tables, people were having uh, cross-political conversations of ardent Republicans and ardent Democrats during the election. And I pulled the pastor aside after and I said, Chuck, you know, how is this possible uh, that, that people are having these conversations and, and doing it well and they're violently disagreeing with, um, you know, this issue of the election? And he said, we have a motto that was, we were founded on and that we live by. We agree to disagree in love moving forward in mission. 
And he said, it depends on what we want to emphasize. If we want to emphasize what the topic that we're agreeing about, that's the least important part of our work together. It's what does it look like to love each other and to live in love, and what does it look like to move forward together in mission. So we don't eliminate that, but we don't pretend that that's the whole picture or that that's the only thing that matters. Another question? Thank you all. Um, can you, uh, I, this is directed to Reverend Joyce. In your presentation, you talked about the use of the prophetic tradition, the Old Testament uh, prophetic tradition. So can, can you speak more to the way that you understand the use of the Old Testament prophetic tradition in creating a positive culture in the midst of division when it is often used as a justification for a hostile and aggressive engagement? Is that clear? Or? Uh, I, I think what, I, what I'm thinking of, uh, and maybe this is maybe for me a, a critique of what I see through the media of evangelicalism, and you know, I'm a little step removed from, I, you know, I don't belong to a non-denominational evangelical church, um, but what I, I hear in the media feels to me like a, some of the discord is because people are really only thinking about personal salvation um, and um, personal, personal goodness and personal evil. And that there's not a recognition, which is in, in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, that there's a societal issue around corporate, um, corporate wrongdoing. Um, and it's hard to call for justice um, in that context. I, I don't know if that helps you. Um, yeah. And I, I'm not sure I share the experience of having people use the Old Testament in a hostile way. But do you want to say anything? Hi. Uh, thank you so much for all those insightful kind of presentations. I think I have to go back to the same question about those rightness and then relationship type of things. So the yeah, relationship has been emphasized over whiteness. That's my understanding. So if that's the case, I'm just asking some questions why you know that Christians has to be martyred because yeah, the relationship is more important than the truth or rightness type of things. And then throughout the whole history, uh, just in, in Christian's perspective or Christian history, how can we then justify our sticking to our faith? Yeah, you know that we have certain kind of differences between seeing the number six, whether it's gonna be six or nine. I fully understand that we have that kind of situation, so we can compromise in that kind of situation. But when we are talking about the God's word and the how to interpret those things, we still may say that there is a six or nine type of differences. But uh, I don't know, yeah, whether my question makes sense or not, but as a kind of new MDiv student who does not know much about the Christianity, I'm just wondering about those kind of questions, yeah. How we can stick to our own faith or our own belief over relationship type of things. Thank you. So uh, it, it's probably the way that I, the way that maybe I put it was not the right way because it makes it sound like it's an either or. Um, and I think that's where we really do get in trouble is if we think that it's an either or. If, if, if we're in, let's just go back, you know, our roots, like I say, family therapy. If you're married uh, or if you have somebody that you love or you're involved in some kind of family, um, whether you disagree with somebody or not is not at the core, hopefully, of your relationship. And it isn't going to break your relationship. And that's not what you're going to spend all your time on talking about at the dinner table. You're going to spend time on a million other things to cultivate that relationship, in addition to acknowledging that you may disagree on things that are important to you. But it's when those get elevated to becoming the most important thing that the relationship starts to get destroyed and people call my wife for therapy. Um, so I think we have to hold, um, we have to hold that 
lightly not dismiss it, but to remember that um, we're keeping the relationship in mind as well as what we firmly believe in, even though we may disagree with other people um, you know, in our community. I don't know if that's a good answer to the question. I think it's a great answer. And here's the thing. You don't have to give up your truth claims in order to be civil with people. And you don't have to give up your truth claims to coexist with people. So I have a brother who is an atheist. He knows I'm an evangelical Christian. I would walk in front of a bullet for him any day, and he would do the same for me. And in fact, when I was a young man really coming into my faith, and he was a young man really figuring out that he was an atheist, one year for my birthday, he bought me rosary beads because we had been raised Catholic, even though he thought what I believed in was ridiculous. But he loved me and respected me so much that he bought me this really important religious artifact to say, I love you and I respect you, even though we completely disagree on this question. And I think if a Christian and an atheist can have that kind of love, there's no reason why Christians can't have a similar kind of love when we're disagreeing about sexual ethics or, you know, whatever the, 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 the topic may be. One more. I think we have time for one more question. Here, I just, and then one more question. Just one, just quickie. And, and I also, I, I feel a real conviction about this, that if the church can't model this, if the church cannot model being able to be in relationship while having strong truth claims. The church doesn't have a witness to the society. I'm sorry. Uh, we just don't. So we got to do it. We have to show it um, before people are going to be attracted to it and imitate it. I would just say, I think Jesus loves me because Jesus loves me as a sheep in, in the Good Shepherd's pasture. Jesus doesn't love me because I think I, I have espoused the right creed and have the, all the right intellectual thoughts. Jesus loves me. That's an affect. Last question. Hi, thank you all so much. Um, I'm just curious how the conversations or these um, strategies might be informed by different power dynamics that people are com coming into in the church, um, specifically thinking about how intimidating it could be for lay people to approach their pastor or their teacher. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of swirling ideas about how um, different people are coming. I mean, hopefully we can have common ground and have e be equals as Christians, but there, there are um, risks for different people in different ways. Um, and you've all listed examples of, of how that can be the case throughout church history. I mean, the risk with slavery was the perpetual dehumanization of a certain category of people. And so that is a much bigger risk than um, kind of going back to Haitian's question about like relationship over rightness. So what happens when the consequences of disagreeing or kind of like an impasse um, pr uh, could produce further harm. So I'm just, just thinking about the power dynamics involved. Yeah, I think, I believe that um, the structures that each have given enables there to be a neutralizing of the misuse of power. And that opens up the opportunity for there to be um, people who are in positions of power and are misusing that power all of a sudden then to be able to unearth that which has gotten frozen so that the conversations that need to happen take place. And that's exactly what's happened, what, what we did. The structure that you provided for union then enabled the power dynamics all of a sudden to be neutralized and for people to actually begin to speak without fear. I have the unenviable position of having to draw us to a close because we do have a hard stop at quarter past. Um, would you please thank our guests? Uh, this is a conversation that's going to go on and on and on. So please, if you have other questions or if questions come to you that you didn't think of now, please email me. You know, you know how to find me, kbarnes at gordonconwell.edu or the Mockler Center. You can, we have a generic Mockler Center address. 
uh, and I will pass those questions on and etc. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint presentations, please again contact me and, and we will send you copies of the PowerPoint presentations. And then lastly, uh, please keep your eyes open for other uh, Mockler Center events. Now that our footprint has expanded, uh, there will be a lot more topics that may scratch where you itch. In March, at the end of the month, I think it's the 28th, in fact, exactly a month from today, uh, uh, Dr. Menard and I are going to be doing a live stream event. Uh, it'll be on YouTube Live. It'll be completely by Zoom, that event. And it's going to be on the, the issue of Sabbath as resilience. Sabbath as resilience. Uh, this is a topic that we are going to be speaking at a conference on together at Wheaton College. So uh, thank you so much all for coming. God bless you all, and we look forward to seeing you. Please take pizza if you, if you, you can. We don't want any leftovers, and there's even a gluten-free one up there on the corner. So thank you for coming. God bless you all.